Hi guys, welcome back to the TRA Performance Education Podcast with me, your tiny titan host, Vicky Masita, as always. And in the hot seat today, talking about an extremely interesting subject is Dr. Paul Rimmer. Please welcome Dr. Paul Rimmer. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you uh, for having me on. So yeah, it's a bit of a weird experience, just us not talking nonsense. So, I know, yeah. It's going to be uh, try, and, try and stay on point today, not get too distracted. But we like talking nonsense. We do actually like talking nonsense, especially with your beard being that long. I think yeah. it's, yeah. It's, gone, it's gone out of control. Too busy <laughs> to get a haircut and beard trim these days. So I'm You see, I was nicely uh, trimmed this morning, so I take care of myself, especially when we're going live on YouTube. You might need to have a nice, fresh shave. I'm just trying to outdo Lee Bell. Yes, that is true. He did look like Wolverine the other day, which was very funny, but only in like the scruffy sense, not the actual like Hugh Jackman sense, obviously. Anywho, um, moving swiftly on. Right. So tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, where you've come from, who you've dated in the past. No, don't do that. Um, but, you know, where you come from, what your background is, that kind of thing. OK, so um, started off always been quite sporty, lifted a few weights from time to time, decided to go and do a degree in something related to it. So yep. my undergraduate degree was in health and exercise nutrition. Um, from that point, decided to then... Um, go and do a master's, wasn't really sure what I was going to do, so I ended up doing a master's in sports injury and rehabilitation, basically because they'd have me and most of the other course spaces were full up, so that was a bit of a segue, so nutrition metabolism was my sort of main passion, and then from that went on and did a PhD in healthcare sciences down in lovely Cardiff, um, and now I'm back up in Leeds where I've got my own little lab and clinic where I do some performance analysis and performance testing, and obviously I've got the TRA stuff as well, so my... Um, my big area of focus at the moment, which I'll be speaking on with uh, Joseph Agu in July. Um, well, not with him, but he's doing some hypertrophy. But in the morning, I'm going to do a little uh, warm-up slot and get the crowd going, hopefully. <laughs> interesting enough today. Um, on just a little bit about metabolic adaptation, some of the sort of ideas around that and, and you know, things to watch out for, how to track and monitor it for with clients and athletes and stuff as well. Okay, perfect, perfect. Now, metabolic adaptation, we're just going to delve straight into it realistically because I suppose there's been a lot of um, hashtag science in metabolic damage. So first okay. of all, let's let's kind of dispel that myth first okay. off. Okay, so meta metabolic adaptation, I'm going to stumble over my words today because metabolic adaptation just doesn't flow off the tongue. So metabolic M -A. adaptation is, is a thing, okay? It's basically how your body responds to changes in energy intake. So that can be both increases and decreases in it. This is a natural positive thing for a lot of cases. So for survival, it's kind of essential that our metabolism adjusts in both directions to maintain healthy fat mass, Well, it tries to anyway. Um, so it's not so much a damage, it's actually a normal adaptation as well. So metabolic adapt uh, damage isn't really a thing as such. Um, you know, what, we, what a lot of people consider as metabolic damage, like reductions in metabolic rate, um, resting metabolic rate based on metabolic rate, are actually just normal physiological adaptations which have kept us, you know, surviving through famine and low food periods and um, and stuff like that as well. So, yeah, metabolic damage isn't really a thing as such. It's more metabolic adaptation, which is a completely normal process. And it's actually the opposite of damage. It's our metabolism working perfectly well and doing us a massive favour. Fantastic. OK, so now that that has been dispelled, let's talk a little bit about people who say that they are completely metabolically damaged and they're on. Um, let's go for the typical bikini athlete, right, in bodybuilding. OK, yeah. um, so you've obviously heard it before. You've seen it before. Training all these hours. Um, they're PTs themselves, so they're on the feet all the time. They've got kids um, and they're doing an hour's worth of cardio in the morning, an hour's post training, and they're on 800, 800 calories a day. What's going on there if they're not losing any more weight? Um, there's, there's two potential, well, there's a few different potential options. There's more than two. One is they genuinely might have some kind of metabolic issue. That's a very, very, very small percentage of the population. Quite often, in my experience, it's down to two things. Small people don't really burn that many calories, unfortunately. Mm. Um, so when you look at some of these people's resting metabolic rate or you look at their overall kind of lean, lean tissue, when they, even when they're being active, they're not burning as many calories. Uh, one of the classic examples is I work with quite a few couples and women tend to get frustrated because they can't lose weight as quickly as men. Yep. Unfortunately, ladies, you just burn less energy. So if you're talking a 45, 50 kilo bikini competitor, um, even if they are quite active on a day to day basis, it might just be, unfortunately, that you're still not in enough of a deficit to elicit fat loss. Um, right. It might actually be that some people are eliciting fat loss. So one thing I've noticed um, could be a bit of a body recomposition effect. But I think when people put themselves into quite large calorie deficits, one of the things that tends to happen is they tend to uh, increase their stress hormones, things like cortisol. Obviously, I'm not difficult to test for this. 
But you tend to find that when people people then, um, after a week or two, maybe of not dropping, they'll have these big drops in weight. Could be water retention due to uh, constipation and things like that. Unfortunately, if high protein diets with, you know, particularly from lower carbohydrates, maybe a lack of fiber in the diet, they're going to get bunged up. So it might not be actual lack of weight loss. Um, longer term, if it is, the other issue is um, quite honestly, a lot of people eat more than they think they are, even if they say they're track, they, they say track. So I've just been working with, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to embarrass my clients if they watch this. Uh, yeah. who, like you've just said there, is a personal trainer, get ready for a photo shoot and weight wasn't coming down, swearing that she was sticking to her calories or macros. And so I took the route of making sure that she took pictures of every single one of her meals. Mm -hmm. And she was probably, in my estimation, under overeating by about 800 to 1,000 calories more than she was on a couple of the days that we were looking at there. So wow, was, was, really? Yeah. That much? Yeah, simply because it was things like um, one of her friends baked protein goodies. So oh. obviously, if it's protein, it's good for you, yeah? Like protein, yeah, snakes, yeah. And protein oh, Honestly, well. I swear to God, I'm going to meet up with Krispy Kreme and just say, I just want to sprinkle a little bit of whey protein on every Krispy Kreme donut and call them a protein donut because they're better. Make, make billions, make billions yeah, from that. exactly right. Um, so yeah, basically, it was things like little protein balls, protein ball, which was like nuts, seeds, dates, dates. things like that. I would estimate at least 150 to 200 calories a ball, four of them, and that's pulling you out. You know, and it's it's it is those. It's a bit cliched, but most of the time with a lot of clients, it is it is those bites, licks, and tastes of BLTs, um, which do add up. And uh, I, I can't I can't claim credit for that one. That's not me. I, I heard that somewhere else before, so I'm not going to claim credit for coming. That's up. incredible. But I'm going to feel it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's 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 a nice little reminder for a lot of people as well. So um, it is one of those things where when we say track, you have to track everything to know there is an issue. Um, I'm a big testing kind of person. So in my lab, I've got access to, to bloods and stuff as well. So if I do suspect um, people have issues, then I'm getting, well, in the process, it's going to arrive this week and get my own RMR tester. So for um, Joseph and my, my day, I'm going to actually get some original data because I'm working with some clients through their contest prep at the moment. So I'm going to look at their RMR adaptations because there's very little stuff out there in terms of uh, physique competitors particularly. Sure. Mm. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, going to get that as well. So what I do is I'm a believer in testing. Um, so if someone does have an issue or a potential issue, we can look at getting things like bloods pulled. I wouldn't recommend that as a first um, sort of port of call, really. I think, you know, usually, I'd say, like I said, a vast majority of the times it is. It is things like people just aren't compensating uh, as much, sorry, are compensate, aren't accounting for the amount of food they're eating or they aren't expending as much as they think they are. Um, but again, it just gives me tools to tend to, a lot of the time, just say, actually, you are perfectly normal. Although I have come across, I have come across one or two clients who definitely do have have had some form of issue. Unfortunately for those guys, um, you know, it can be triggered by they can have a perfectly normal functioning metabolism when they're in like normal kind of calorie intake maintenance, say, or slightly over maintenance if they're an off-season bodybuilder. Second, they start dieting for some reason, um, it can initiate a bit of dieting stress. Um, you know, so aggressive deficits in particular might trigger it for some people. But again, without testing, you just don't really know those things. So, you know, some people just can drop weight dead linearly or they might have these little plateaus, um, whereas others, it is very difficult. And unfortunately, it is just one of those things for a lot of people. You just have to dig a little bit deeper, I'm afraid. And um, weight loss isn't easy. Um, the example I always give is if we consider that a pound of fat is around about three and a half thousand calories, give or take. I know the scientists out there are going, it's not exactly the same as that. I know, but for the sake of argument, we'll call it that. Yeah. That means to lose two pounds a week, which is a healthy rate of weight loss. That's 7,000 calories, which is a 1,000 calorie deficit a day. If you're a small bikini competitor who maintains on 1,500, 1,700 calories, um, and you're having to you know, do that through cardio and exercise, that's a lot of expenditure. It's a lot. That is those two hours in the gym. That is that 800, 900 calories to get that two pounds a week. And it's one of the reasons I have a big issue with the term healthy weight loss. Um, mm. One to two pounds a week is it's usually touted as, is because actually... For some people, that's a struggle. And the word healthy, I don't know about you, but me personally, I think the word healthy kind of is associated with easy. If it's healthy, it's easy. It's meant to be like, you know, a moderate amount of weight loss. For a lot of women, losing two pounds a week is a, is a challenge. It's a challenge. Even people who, you know, train twice a day, like you were saying, that small bikini competitor. So I don't think in those situations, it's necessarily metabolic adaptation that's causing the issue. It is just a case of, I think it's uh, expectation management a lot of time with people is understanding that it is going to be a slower process. Um, and it's not like your metabolism is ever going to adapt to the point if, if you've got a normal functioning metabolism where it's actually going to stop weight loss. It might slow rate slightly, but actually, um, again, it's never going to really be your basal metabolic rate. That's the problem. It's not going to be like your, your resting metabolic rate is what drops. It's usually um, your, you know, your non-resting energy expenditure stuff. So things like your meat will decrease. So they've shown some studies where 
uh, people will fidget less, for example. Sure. And it's just things like that you can't consciously control. And the other one that I tend to get as well is what I call a lot of compensatory behavior. So you'll get somebody who, let's say, I just did the dog bark in the background there. Um, oh, do you know what? I've just got a noisy house, haven't I? I just need to um, kind of tell everybody to shut the hell up. Yeah. But it's That's no, but it's apt. It's apt because it's a nice little link to this. So one of the classic things would be like a compensatory behavior by which somebody, um, let's say they walk the dog for an hour every evening, but then they join a gym and they go and do a 25-minute hit class. They come out the gym, they're tired, they go home, and then they don't take the dog for a walk. You just take it to the end of the street to have a picnic. Yeah. So instead of taking that dog for the walk, what you're doing is you're creating this compensatory behavior by which people think that structured exercise is going to elicit loads of fat loss. And don't get me wrong, you know, our exercise should be geared around uh, body composition. So res- I'm a big fan of resistance training with my clients as opposed to just doing normal cardio because it influences body composition, retention of lean mass, things like that. But ultimately, when it comes to the weight loss component, people vastly, vastly, vastly un- underestimate um, the influence of your non-exercise activity stuff, your day-to-day sure. things. Mm. And, in weight, and in weight loss studies, the, 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 uh, when people don't get expected weight loss results from studies, when they sort of map things out, it's inevitably the neat, the non-exercise component of activity, which is actually where people are compensating. It's very rarely their basal metabolic rate that is causing those slow-ins in, in weight loss, really. So it's these sort of subconscious things, maybe, or sometimes conscious things we don't consider as, as having a massive uh, influence, you know, um, which have the biggest effect. Yeah. Okay. So let's take into account other things that could happen because obviously our bodies are very, very clever, aren't they? And they basically just need to survive. So once um, a certain level of food goes down and we don't have that um, amount coming in, especially for a female body, it can start to obviously go through different changes, which includes slowing of the reproductive system, which can cause obviously menstrual amenorrhea. Um, So let's go into that kind of thing. Is that going to have any kind of uh, metabolic adaptation issues if you were to experience amenorrhea as as a female? that's, that's, That's kind of a bit caught before the horse really, because it would likely be that reductions in things like Uh, hormones like leptin which is a central regulator so our fat cells produce leptin and it's a sort of fuel gauge of the body as we get leaner or as a response to long-term caloric restriction like you might find with uh, women who get amenorrhea what you'll find then is it's a feedback thing so our body goes into i don't want to use survival mode because it's uh it, it basically is that but basically our functions become then about conserving energy and it's the same with guys as well. Guys will get lower testosterone levels as a result of long-term dieting. Um, sure. and, you know, and mood states can be influenced, same with women as well. Um, and yeah, so basically that's just as, as a result of the lower body fat store. So it is, it's one of those things where I think you know, dieting for a physique show for a woman, it is about timing it right. You can't just stay lean for months and months and months of the year. There has to be diet breaks within there as well to limit those facts, uh, facts those effects. But yeah, so it does It does happen, but it's as a result of lower body fat levels. It's not one cause and the other. So it, it is one cause and the other, but it's, it's fat loss first results in the amenorrhea typically. Um, so yeah, I think to restrict that is quite challenging. It's something mm. that I think, like I said, diet breaks, not competing too frequently, for, particularly for certain women might be an advantage. But yeah, it's these reductions in these hormones because ultimately our body goes into a, right, what is an essential function? Do you know what I mean? How do we conserve energy? And sexual reproduction becomes a secondary priority to, you know, maintaining fat mass. Um, same with guys as well. It's one of the reasons why, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes sense to, to, keep our, to keep ourselves wired, which is why obviously we get increases in hunger, we get increases in our stress horm- hormones. So one of the things you'll tend to find with um, people who diet quite aggressively or for long periods is, their sleep will get disrupted, but they don't particularly feel tired. So they're, they're, wired, they're fatigued, but they're wired because their brains are just constantly under that stressed environment by which they want to, you know, they want to seek out foods that, and then have a big meal of carbs and watch people pass out because there's this sort of inverse relationship between kind of carbohydrate intake or high carbohydrate intake and possibly just calorie intake as well, which will then take that diet stress off, which I think when people's weight won't drop, is what tends to happen. I've noticed, and it's quite a common thing in the bodybuilding world, is someone will have a higher day. I'm not talking thousands of grams of carbs, but a moderately higher day. Diet stress drops, they wake up the next day and they're two or three pounds lighter. Yeah. So I, think, yeah. I think that's typically to do with actually that stress response. Water messes with the, uh, the sort of water regulation system, it interferes with those pathways. So I think that's more the issue actually when a lot of people don't drop. So don't be afraid to take the odd higher day here and there as long as it's not on doing your weekly averages. Um, and yet that might have, again, it's very vastly under researched. It might have some, um, it might have some influence on, on actually preserving and protecting against things like amenorrhea. Short term overfeeding studies are few and far between. There's some evidence mm-hmm. to suggest, like you said, with leptin, it might have small transient increases, but how that impacts on overall metabolism is, is, you know, 
Uh, I'm not going to draw too many firm conclusions on that today. If people want to know about that, they can come to the talk. So yeah, 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 exactly. So that's it. That's it. So I'll get into the nitty-gritty of it. So yeah, it is a thing. Um, but I mean, touch wood, I've never had. It's difficult, obviously, when clients or female clients are using um, contraception because they're they're obviously putting in synthetic progesterone and estrogen into their bodies. Sure. But touch wood, uh, clients that haven't done that, I've not had any cessate, have cessation of their periods as of yet. Um, you know, and if for me personally as a coach, um, not that I do a lot of coaching, but a bit of coaching I do. Um, you know, it would be definitely a red flag for me. It's like, look you know, your reproductive health is more important than a show. So I know some coaches won't do that with me personally. I have certain lines that I won't push my a client's body past. So like I said before, if I've got clients who are, who I think are sticking to their diet and their weight's not dropping, or I think there might be other metabolic issues, I'll always go and get them tested. And I think, you know, if you're working with physique competitors in particular, it's important for them to go and get their bloods done regularly, whether they're, nat whether they're natural or they're assisted. Um, I think that's really important, particularly with females, um, because like you say, you, you don't want to, they do tend to have to dig a little bit deeper to get those losses in body fat, which means lower calorie intake, greater output through cardio, a lot more stress on the body. So, um, so yeah, I think I, I personally would recommend that as a kind of a side really is to make sure you're getting bloods done. Definitely. At least start end point and at least possibly a couple of points through prep if possible. Um, yeah. But definitely afterwards as well, just to make sure everything's hunky dory, especially if anything sort of red flags like that. Definitely, definitely. I completely agree as well. Okay, so why don't we talk about the actual reversing of it then? So if you've had these metabolic adaptations in a low calorie state, how about people who have said that they've actually been able to raise their basal, basal metabolic rate and be able to consume a lot more calories after they've gone this deep? What's what's happening from there? There's um, So there's two there's two ways you can look at this. So when, when we diet, like I said before, most of the adaptations actually take place in our non-resting energy expenditure. So it takes place in terms of our need, our thermic effect of food if we're adjusting calorie intake, because if we eat foods, it takes energy to digest and absorb it. Yep. Smaller portions means less energy to digest and absorb it. And then obviously our exercise output can drop as well, because obviously we're tired out of the gym. In terms of basal metabolic rate, we can get quite large reductions in basal metabolic rate. Um, but again, it tends to depend on the individual. Um, you know, if you look at some studies, so the ones that in bodybuilders, you tend to get, there's one study, which is like the, the, the gentleman that was in the study, it was a case study, had like a thousand calorie reduction in his basal metabolic rate in the first 13 mm. weeks of diet. And that's huge. Massive. So that might be a measurement error though. So there's always things like that we need to consider. Other, okay. studies, other studies have shown that that's not necessarily been the case, but it seems to be there's, it's the aggressiveness of diet that I would think, I would uh, theorize is the most important factor. So if you're dieting on a, in a deficit of over 1,000 calories a day, and from other studies, that's where you're likely to get these larger reductions in BMR. So it's still quite a large deficit. Sure. Um, again, again, though, when it comes to the reversing out of that, there's two schools of thought. So obviously, if you've been in a huge deficit, you can increase, reduce your deficit slowly over time. But ultimately, um, your metabolism is governed by leptin. Yeah. Right. So in order for your basal metabolic rate to recover, you need to start increasing your fat mass. Because Indeed, yeah. fat mass is, good, is what determines leptin secretion. So actually, if you're in a huge deficit and you're just reducing that deficit slowly, your body's still recognizing it's in a deficit. Yeah. So me personally, even if you're, say your BMR was here and then it's dropped and you're here, you still want to bring that up a little bit quicker. So I don't buy into this adding in 50 to 100 calories a week after a show. No, not that. Particularly for physique competitors, simply because all that's going to happen is it's just prolonging the deficit of the diet. On the other side of the spectrum, yes, overweight people do tend to have faster metabolisms than, um, than leaner people because although it's e uh, easier in the modern day environment to override, there's a certain threshold in terms of body fatness, which is also detrimental to our health as well. You know, so yes, it can increase, but how much you can do that independently of increases in muscle size, I very much doubt you tend to find a lot of these people who can eat 5,000, 6,000 calories a day. They tend to pack a ton of muscle and they also tend to be very active as well. So mm -hmm. I, do, I, don't, I do think you can increase your basal metabolic rate. But actually, when you think about what your basal metabolic rate is, which is just things like organ function at rest, even muscle mass isn't contributing massively to that because your muscles aren't working at the time. It's only yes. then when you start moving around. So that's why muscle mass combined with activity is going to have a much more profound effect on your overall daily expenditure than just having a ton of muscle and being sat there all day. I know mm. much bigger bodybuilders, for example, who really struggle to get the food volume into support muscle growth, just try and be as, as unactive or inactive as possible. 
because they actually physically to get the food volume relative if they start moving about the amount of energy it is to just lug their frames around all day is quite difficult so i think from the reverse for the reverse dieting thing i think there's, there's evidence that we know metabolic adaptation takes place in terms of our resting metabolic rate the extent to which that takes place is going to be quite individual um, mm. and like i said we'll discuss that on the day however what i would do personally if i was working with someone after a show is I would take them up to around their previous maintenance calories without, without obviously the extra activity. And then we monitor. If they start gaining body fat rapidly, then either, again, they're overeating massively, or it is there's the potential as a metabolic adaptation there. So what we do then is we just reduce their calories until things level out. And then over time, we can then increase them as they go deeper into their off-season. The other thing as well, though, is that increased body fatness is going to be an advantage in an off season anyway. So I want to get, if I've got clients who've got a six, seven month off season before they start a competition season, I don't want them in a deficit for as long as possible. And then getting a bit fluffy isn't going to be an issue because it's going to put them, it's going to help their bodies recover better, not just in terms of their basal metabolic rate, but things like their sex hormones, you know, stuff that's going to help promote a more anabolic muscle building environment. The real question then is what you do with weight loss clients, because obviously once they've lost the weight, you don't want to come back out. So, um, I think diet breaks might be an effective strategy for that. Um, I know guys like Eric Helms and people like that are, are big fans of the sort of diet breaking and things. Sure. Um, again, there's some there's some evidence to suggest that you know smaller diet breaks. And the one thing you need to look at with um, a lot of these studies when it talks about metabolic adaptations, there's so much variation in there. You get people dieting on 800 calories, you get very little amount of metabolic adaptation. You get some like the, uh, the you know the TV show Biggest Loser. There was a big study done on those competitive. Uh, yeah, it was like two years that, later as well, wasn't it? Yeah, so they did a study on those guys, and like some of those people were in huge deficits, 3,000 calories a day, got no adaptation whatsoever, but there definitely seemed to be this sort of threshold. So I think tentatively, we want to create a, a good deficit would be around about 1,000 calories per day where we didn't seem to get any adaptation in those things. But again, there's likely to be a huge amount of individual variation. So to say that, to say that, um, to say that it doesn't take place would be naive, but I do think that people put an overemphasis on that side of things in terms mm. of how much of a reduction it is. I mean, most studies would be in the region of sort of 10 to 20% of reduction in your basal metabolic rate. So if it was, say, 1,500, you're only going to drop 150 to 200 maybe off that, unless you're going hyper-aggressive. But with that overweight person who's coming down, if we're using a more aggressive strategy, again, it's not just going to be, it's not likely to just be the um, amount of deficit. There's likely to be a function of the duration of deficit as well. So right. actually, if we're being more aggressive, then actually, theoretically speaking, I would, I would, you know, I want to do some research into this myself because it's an understudied area, is to actually, one of the reasons I'm buying all this kit, um, is so that we can actually look at, actually, if we get more aggressive weight loss initially, but we're doing, doing diet breaks, do we get these adaptations more as opposed to, obviously, if you're doing the same level of aggression, but for longer, we might expect that. It's mm. also going to be harder to adhere to as well. So I think, you know, I think there's a difference between a crash diet for weight loss in overweight people and an aggressive or rapid weight loss because a crash diet is just cutting all the foods out, risk of lean mass loss. You know, it's not just about the calories. It's about the, the quality and the, the quantity of macronutrients in the diet and the training that accompanies with that. So I'm not a fan of crash diets, just to clarify that. But I do see a position for rapid weight loss if it's structured in such a way that allows us to preserve lean tissue as best we can um, and also that it's there's, there's a there's an end game. Once we've got that initial loss, it's understandable that every say, you know, every six to eight weeks or every four to six weeks, once we've got those four weeks, actually what we do is do increase calories a bit, and that then, as a coach, gives us some insight as to actually find out if their maintenance has adjusted or adapted because we can just take them back up. Previous, well, we need to find their maintenance anyway because assuming they're coming to us overweight, then obviously they're above maintenance. So exactly, yeah, they're over We need to yeah. use those little diet breaks to sort of find their maintenance, and we can use that to inform. So I'm a big believer in, yes, we use science as a framework to create our theories and our philosophies, but there's a huge amount of individual data in that as well. So one of the things that I, like, I preach to the, the people I mentor and I work with is, yes, we use science as a framework, but we need to be collecting individual data. It's not just a case of getting people to track their macros and their weight for, for just for weight loss. We need to be seeing where people are plateauing, how we break through those plateaus, um, working with women when they're on the menstrual cycle. I think with some of my clients, I can predict when they're going to come on their periods before they do because you just get used to seeing that data. Yeah. Um, but also things as well as in terms of backing out, things like diet breaks, what am I doing there? I don't just say to people, right, take a week off your diet, go away, disappear. It's like, right, okay, we're going to try this, keep tracking. So over time then, once that diet phase is completed, hopefully with those people who are overweight, it gives us an idea where we can take them back to safely 
without needing to reverse diet 50 100 calories a week where i can say okay we've dieted you here i, I know you were there we're going to guess about there i can take you straight back up but then again we track we monitor we adjust all the time um so i think that's a fundamental tenet of i think there's a lot of people who consider themselves evidence-based practitioners because they understand the science but that's not what an evidence-based practitioner is there's still an individual component of feeding back into that it's using yeah. that data to, to create optimal solutions for, for the individuals that we work with but i do think there is there's a it, it's getting it's getting less so but there is an overemphasis on terms of these reductions in basal metabolic rate and like i said before in that one physique competitor that was huge but in others in other studies where they've looked at them like over say a 16-week contest prep some people's basal metabolic rate seems to increase so it's just, you know, to say that it's, it definitely occurs for every single person is, is um, it's probably taking a step a little bit too far for my liking. But mm. you know, it, does, it does highlight, I mean, obviously not all coaches have access to be able to do good work. Not all coaches have access to, to test things like resting metabolic rate. But we can inform those decisions by not just putting someone in off-season mode and just leaving them to it. We need to make sure that we're tracking those people for periods afterwards. But in terms of reverse dieting, as is, is, it, is prescribed, do I use it? Not personally, because I want that diet stress off as quickly as possible, especially for athletes. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement. It's like when I first start a, um, a prep with my clients, I'll put them into an aggressive deficit right at the start because that is when they are at their fattest. Their energy levels are higher, and they've obviously got more body fat to lose in that, in that regard. So put them in... Well. And they're, again. Motivated in that phase. and they're motivated in that phase as well. So you want to capitalize on that motivation. Absolutely. Right. So as long as they're obviously not like already pretty lean and you don't need to aggressively diet them, as long as they do have some good body fat in order to come off, aggressively diet them for a good four to six weeks and then bring them back up a little bit, have a little bit of stagnation period where they can possibly harden up at that point and then start to decrease them down again in a much slower fashion in order to go to show. But then coming out of the show, I'm exactly the same. So aggressively diet them back up, you know, get them up to maintenance level as quickly as possible, regulate those hormones, make them feel normal again, yeah. um, and then start to increase things, obviously, depending on how long their off season is going to be. And then take things from there. And like we said, it comes in stages. It's not just a, a generic kind of weight loss and weight gain isn't linear. Never is, um, especially safe or effective weight think, loss. Um, I, think, I think what's really interesting, what you've highlighted there is because I've done it personally. So although I'm a terrible, terrible bodybuilder, I have competed before. Please don't look for stage picks. It's really nothing spectacular. To I will find them and I shall post them in the comments underneath. <laughs> so, but basically one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of people, I think, like to blame metabolic damage or metabolic adaptation or whatever they want to refer to it as for the fact they gain loads of weight post-show. When mm -hmm. actually, let's be honest, your drive is to eat. And it's completely natural when you dieted that long. And, you know, your, every ounce of your body, you know, your hunger hormones are, are driving you to eat. You know, leptin, ghrelin, they're all driving you to eat. Insulin levels are generally kind of lower because that's another thing that, you know, helps us feel fuller. There's a whole cascade of hormones that are just driving us to eat. And then you come off the back of a show, once those, you know, those, that leash is taken off, and then people eat like an arsehole. And they'll eat five, 6,000 calories a day. And it's natural to do that. But then what they'll do is, they, oh, you know, I gained 20, 30 pounds in the first four or five weeks post-show. Yeah, it was my meta metabolism that was adapted. If you were eating like that the rest of the year, you'd just be like, I'm just being a fat bastard. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that's I think that's the important thing to realize there is that you know it's it is one of those things that uh, I do I've heard quite a lot and it's like I said it's becoming less prevalent in the industry a lot of people are becoming more clued in in terms of metabolism and stuff now and it's a really positive thing I mean through like podcasts like yourself I know you've had some really good guys on here as well uh, so I know I'm in very good company so I'm grateful for the invite to come on anyway but it, um but well, yeah, it wasn't really know, more of an invite it was more of like a rimmer you're coming on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so please, please feel front. You haven't made fun of my nickname, so my surname so far yet. So that's that's the main thing. No, I just don't do that. I just uh, to be fair, I don't even know why I said it in the message today. I, I sent um, for everybody who doesn't know, I sent Paul a message just ba basically saying, "Hey, Rimmer, here's the link," <laughs> and that was it. And it was just like, "I'll see you in a minute." But I don't know why I've never actually capitalized on taking the piss out of your name. <laughs> It's the, only reason so, I started lifting weights and, it's the only reason I started lifting weights and growing muscle and getting tattoos was so people didn't pick on me for my surname. That was the, <laughs> that was the But now I can take the piss out of you because you'd be being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything but the name. Anything but the name. Anything but the name. That's good. And I think that is a, po a perfectly positive note. Perfectly positive. That's a really 
hard thing to say, um, to finish it on realistically, isn't it? So if you want to know more about metabolic adaptation and plenty of other um, enhancing performance, um, then obviously come on down to the TRA uh, Performance Education Seminar that Paul is going to be hosting there with Joseph Agu on um, performance nutrition which I will put the link in underneath and all the dates that everybody needs to put into their diary. Not only will Paul and Joseph be there, but I will be as well. So, you know, what more can you ask for, Most really? Oh, and Lee. Lee's going to be there too. Be Shout out to Lee Bell. We're going to have a beard off. <laughs> We're going to have a beard off. I best not shave then for at least a no. couple of weeks. Definitely. So that'll be all right. So, Paul, um, tell everybody where people can find you and um, harass you and take the piss out of your name and um, so on okay. and so on. So obviously I'm one of the guys at TRA Performance Education. That's mine and Lee's business. Um, got my own website, which is www.nexusperformanceanalysis.com, which has got all my services on it. Nice little shameless plug there. I'm basically <laughs> at the moment, but my lab is completely portable. So if anyone wants to do any testing and stuff like that, give me a shout. And yeah, I'm on Instagram as Paul Rimmer PhD. So it's when Vicky introduced me, she called me Mr. Mr. Paul. Oh. No, I didn't. I just said Paul, didn't I? You said Mr. Mr. Did I? Yeah, you were Mr. Mr. Dr. Paul. Mr. Dr. Okay. Paul. Uh, and then, yeah, and then obviously on Instagram as well, my other business is um, Nexus Performance Analysis and TRA Performance Edu, I think is our TRA one as well. So if you don't follow that, please give us a shout because I do little short videos and stuff um, talking about some of the science-y type things as well. So it's not just me, you know, looking like a terrible bodybuilder. I do try and put some uh, informative content on there as well. So thanks for having me, guys, and I will speak to you all soon.